Continuing on with the gas laws, today in our adventure we're going to kick off by studying Charles' Law. What is Charles' Law? If given temperature and volume, I can use Charles' Law to mathematically calculate the missing temperature or volume. So Friday we dealt with Boyle's Law, pressure and volume, and that they were inversely related. Today's gas law is Charles' Law temperature and volume. Boyle's Law looked at how pressure affected volume, but what about temperature? How will temperature affect volume if you keep pressure the same? As temperature goes up, volume of the gas goes up, and vice versa. What law describes temperature and volume? Charles' Law. This is a quick illustration of Charles' Law. Charles' Law is the relationship between volume and temperature of a gas. Um, we're going to keep the pressure constant and we're going to keep the number of moles constant. As you see here, we have our classic illustration of piston and cylinder where we entrap a certain volume of gas at a given pressure. In this particular diagram, we're going to now add heat to it with some fire or whatever you want to do to heat the temperature up and then as you can see, as the molecules become hotter, they have more force, they travel quicker, they lift the piston up to a much bigger volume. And so this illustrates the fact that when you increase temperature, you increase the volume. And then if you allow it to cool, take away the heat and allow the gas to cool, the gas will now fall back to a smaller volume as you go to a smaller temperature. So Temperature and volume are directly proportional. You increase one, you increase the other. And if you want them to be directly proportional exactly, you got to use absolute temperature. So you use the Kelvin temperature. If you double the Kelvin temperature, you will double the volume. And this little illustration here shows you the volumes going up by twice and going down by half as the temperature does the same. All right, so what does this mean practically speaking? Here's Jacques Charles, 1746 to 1843. All right, so we're going to place a balloon in the water. What happens to the size of the balloon? It's getting more voluminous. Now, what happens if you just trap some air underneath the... You see what's happening? The hot air is pushing the balloon up. And if you have a much smaller balloon and hold it there so that no hot air is produced, then you can see it growing. So as temperature goes up, volume goes up. Mathematical law that we will use, V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2. Now, that dude pointed this out. In order for this to work, you don't get a choice as to what temperature scale you will use. No choice. You have to use the Kelvin scale. Why do you have to use the Kelvin scale? Can we even reach absolute zero? No. That means the whole natural world is above zero. The whole natural world is above zero. Can you say the same thing about Celsius or Fahrenheit? Can you say that everything in the world, in the universe, is above zero in Celsius and Fahrenheit? Negatory. You can have zero degrees Celsius. You can have zero degrees Fahrenheit. And what happens if you try dividing or multiplying by zero? It, there you get an error. So we cannot, it, it's not if it's convenient. No, no, no. It is mandatory that you have to use Kelvin. Some people think, well, as long as both temperatures are positives, then it's okay to use Celsius. No, 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 no. You have to to use Kelvin. You don't have a choice. The whole gas laws, all of them, are built 
upon the foundation of Kelvin. And if you use Celsius, you're going to get the wrong answer. If you use Celsius, you're going to get the wrong answer. All right, so they started monkeying around with these things. And for example, they took nitrogen, 10 grams of nitrogen. They cooled it down, 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 cooled it down till around 210 below zero. And they discovered that it condensed at that point. It became a liquid. But if you were to take a ruler and a straight edge or a straight edge and extrapolate back where it would meet the axis, the x-axis, they discovered something very interesting. Oxygen, cool it down, cool it down, cool it down to around minus 190, extrapolate onward, same point. If you change the mass of the things, extrapolate, where do all lines meet? At one point. That's what allowed them to define what absolute zero was. Absolute zero is a theoretical point. We've never reached it. We've come very close. We've never reached it. People always ask me, well, what happens at absolute zero? Well, one of three things. Number one, it is possible that the electrons will around the atoms will fall into the nucleus because they won't have any kinetic energy keeping them away from the nucleus. Number two, it, it, the universe as we know it could cease to exist. Or number three, what could really be catastrophic would be if the Chicago Cubs were to win the World Series. That could, be, that could happen if somebody reaches absolute zero. We don't know. It got kind of scary there back in, I think it was 2005, when they reached the first, the first uh, level of the playoffs, the first round of the playoffs, and they got into the second round, and they were just an out away against the Florida Marlins, I think. They were an out away from going on to the championship series. And people started wondering, is this, is this the end of the world as we know it? <laughs> Gotta love the Cubbies. Gotta love the Cubbies. How do you convert Celsius to Kelvin? Add 273, that easy. Add 273. Oh, I forgot to tell you guys, this is chemistry, so you should have out your periodic table and your calculators. All right, let's make the following conversions. 25C to, two se to uh, Kelvin, add 273. 25 plus 273 is... Thirty-three degrees C to Kelvin. Thirty-three plus two seventy-three is one twenty-seven C to Kelvin. One twenty-seven plus two seventy-three is one two hundred Kelvin to two to Celsius. Ah, did you try adding? No, you should not have added. You should subtract. 313 Kelvin to Celsius. I tell you what, I, all of a sudden I'm intensely curious as to why Fahrenheit and Celsius have the little degree sign, but Kelvin does not. So if you can find out that for me, I'll give you extra credit. How much? 10 points. Well, the first person who finds it out for me is the only to get here. Yeah. What will be the volume of a gas at 25 degrees C if its original temperature was zero and the volume of 2.0 liters? So our equation is V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2. What is the original volume? Oh, here's the word original. T1 
temperature and volume. What is the original <coughs> temperature? <coughs> ah! It's not zero. 273. Why? Because you have to. Not optional. You have to convert to Kelvin. Equals. What will be the volume? So volume 2 is X. And temperature 2 is 25 plus 273 is 298. So cross multiply 2.00 times 298 equals 273X. Then you're going to have to divide by 273. So, now that I understand the concept, as temperature goes up, volume goes up by the same amount, what happened to the temperature? The temperature went up by a little bit, so my volume should go up or down by a little bit. So I should expect an answer to be 2 point, okay. So, if they give it to you in two decimal place, Please give it back to them in two decimal place. Be consistent. Be consistent. If you have 3.50 liters of a gas at a temperature of 13 degrees C, what will the temperature have to be if the gas were expanded to a volume of 5? So what is the original conditions? 3.50 liters when the temperature is two eighty six. Okay, if the volume goes to five point zero liters, the temperature must. So it looks like the volume is going up by a bit, so the temperature should go up by a bit. Cross multiply. So 5 times 286 divided by 3.50 equals Okay, how many decimal places did they give you temperature? Four eight or four oh nine? Can you round up? Four eight point five. Then you can round up to four oh nine. Formula four oh nine. Found out in WTF facts. Guess why it's called Formula four oh nine? That's a cleanser, by the way. Because Formula one through four oh eight did not work out. I kid you not. It's called Formula four oh nine because 408 formulas did not work. If you have a 2.50 liter gas balloon, that's volume, at a temperature, there's temperature, and it's heated up to a temperature, what will the new volume be? V1 over T1. equals x over so 2.5 times 303 divided by 293 x is equal to I should expect it to be like probably maybe 4 or something like that right because temperature went up by a little bit so what Oh, I'm sorry. Temperature went up by just a tiny little bit, so yeah. So the volume should have gone up by a tiny little bit. Easy peasy lemon squeezy. So let's see if we can't answer some of these questions that require you to think. 
knowing the how these gases behave when temperature increases at a constant <coughs> pressure answer the following question why does bread rise when baked why does bread rise when baked okay so temperature increases what volume Why are there small air bubbles in there? Ah, okay. So the yeast is going to eat the sugar and produce what? What gas? Does anyone remember from biology? Carbon. Carbon is not a gas, it's a solid. How about carbon dioxide? No, you said carbon. Oh, well then that's right. Good job, Randy. Carbon dioxide. So, you put the dough in there and then you see the dough begin to rise. You should always put the dough in a nice warm place like an oven. Not, you're not wanting to bake it yet, you just want to warm it up. Why? What happens to the size of the bubble as you warm up? It increases. Now, when you bake it, what happens to the size of the bubble? It gets even bigger. So. If you've ever noticed, the fluffier the bread, the more holes are in the bread. Those holes are caused by the gases. Uh, cheese is made in a similar way. Those holes in cheese, in Swiss cheese, is caused by gases. Yeah, those beautiful, perfectly round holes are caused by warmed up gases. Now, what about matzah? Do you, do you know what matzah is? Uh, it's like it's kind of like a cracker. The Jewish people celebrate Passover, and part of their celebration is to remember that the day that they were liberated from Egypt, it was a quick thing, so they did not have time for their bread to rise. So they actually make bread without any yeast, which means it becomes a... A very very flat bread very flat very thin bread like a cracker okay they uh, they symbolize yeast as uh, w with sin so a couple days before Passover they'll actually in, in a kind of like a, a, a child's game they'll have the ch they, they hide packets of yeast around the house so the children have to go and find the packets of yeast and if they return with the little packet they get a little prize uh, as a symbolic of you know you get the yeast out then there's no chance that your bread will rise okay because to them uh, yeast is simple in that it puffs you up it's pride pride is uh, to them a form of sin okay so a little little history lesson there, religion lesson, along with the fact that the reason why bread is fluffy is because of Charles's law, right? Is hot air more dense or less dense than cold air? Has anyone ever been in a hot air balloon? No? I've, I want to go. Once? In a helium balloon? Helium balloon and hot air. Why? Because I don't like heights. Well, then why would you go in a hot air balloon if you don't like heights? It's not like you're going to go down. I wanted to try it. Okay, so you wanted to brave it. All right, so. Actually, I think it's quite fascinating that the balloon usually inflates when it's on the ground like that. They have this heating system. The burner actually rotates, so it starts heating up the air inside the balloon. It doesn't use helium. Helium is used for, uh, for blimps. It doesn't use, it just uses plain old air. So, what happens to the volume of the balloon as you heat up? Okay, it goes up. Now, let's remember what density is. Density is mass over volume. So, the mass of the air is not going to change, it's just air. But what happens to its volume? It goes up or down? So what happens to the fraction as the numerator stays the same, but the volume, the denominator, goes up? 
Let's see. 1 over 2, 1 over 3, 1 over 4. What's happening to the overall fraction is getting smaller. Okay, so the air inside here is becoming less dense. So what does that mean? That means that the cooler, more dense air around it will begin to flow around it and accumulating underneath and will begin pushing. Hot air does not rise, folks. Hot air is pushed up. It is bullied up to the top. That's right. So once the hot air balloonist gets to the altitude that it wants, that he wants, then uh, or she, then what what does he do in order to come back down? What? Okay. Yeah, if you let it cool down, then what happens to the density of the balloon? Starts to go back up. Good. Starts to go back up which means overall the balloon, because of the baskets and the weight, will start to come back down as it starts to gain the same temperature as the ambient temperature. Now, if it needs to come down real quick, what do they do? You know, you, I thought you said oh, it. Well, um, they have a, well, they usually heat it back up to make it slow down. Well, if they want to come back down quick, oh, quickly. Okay. Yeah, they have these b baffles. Is that what it's called? Baffles? They, they're able to open up the top and allow the air to escape. So as they start letting the air escape, they start coming down. So yes? Well, the thing is, I mean, remember that there's air molecules striking, that the balloon is warmer. So as the air molecules strike it, it, it takes off with some of the heat from the balloon. Okay, so eventually the balloon will start cooling down, and when it does, the sheer weight of the basket is going to bring it down. So no, it can't stay up there forever because you would need a forever heat source to be constantly heating it up. But what, like, would it, would it fall like straight down? Like Well, you know, I don't know for sure. I think the only way it can go shooting down is if you cut the ropes, <laughs> which I don't think they, I mean, those ropes are very hard to cut. Yeah. Why do hot air balloons rise? We just explained that. Okay, here's the big one. Why are thermostats found in the second, well, first of all, where are they going to be found, first or second? Second, any first? Okay, why second? Heat doesn't rise, heat is pushed. So what? Okay, so the second floor of any house is always going to be warmer or colder. Okay, because when the air comes in, it pushes up the warm air. So the second floor will always be warmer than the first floor, right? So do you want to put a thermostat here or here? Okay, let's, let's take it one season at a time. What about during the winter months? Do you want to place it on top or on the bottom? If you place it on the bottom because it's always cool, then it's always going to be on trying to warm up the bottom. What happens to the poor, unfortunate souls that live in the second floor? Okay, so yes, if you put it in the first floor during the summer months, during the winter months, then the second floor people are going to be hotter than they should because they're going to be getting heat from the vents and they're going to get heat from the stairs. So you're going to get a double whammy of heat. What about during the summer months? During the summer months? You want it to be up in the second floor because the first floor is already naturally cool, so it'll turn itself off 
And what happens to the second floor people? They will once again be too hot upstairs. Now there is something that you can do, and this is something that I can do in order to improve the situation. During the summer months, since this is naturally cooler, I will close or almost close the vents up here and I will open the vents up here. What does that force my cool air to do? Go up to the top. So that will help cool down the oven people that are up there. Okay, during the winter months, I open and close. Who can tell me why? Remember, the second floor people are already being warmed up by the hot air that is being pushed up, right? So they're already getting warm up. It's these cooler first floor people that need the, the, the warmth. So that's why I open them up. I open up the vent in the first floor and I close them up in order to force the warm air to be mainly here. But what about these people? Oh, they're going to get warm, believe me. <laughs> They're going to get one. All right? We're done.